So let's get right to it, guys. We had a uh, uh, pick-by-pick -pick series. You're going to read about it on CBSSports.com. We did the entire draft, so you'll see all the draft strategies. But we're going to break it down, like I said, early, middle, late. So let's start with the start of the draft. I had the first overall pick. Keith was second. Dave was third. Um, uh, Dave was third. Ben was fourth. And here's my team at the number one overall spot. You see the first 12 picks, the guys at the bottom, Daryl Williams, Anthony McFarland, James Washington. We went 15 rounds. No kicker or defense because Heath would yell at us. And so here's what I did to start my team. Two running backs, two wide receivers, and then another running back in David Johnson. And so my strategy after picking first overall is just kind of sit back and say, okay, what's going to happen? Typically, you're going to see wide receiver, wide receiver at the two, three turn because just the talent that's there, it just makes sense to do that. Now, George Kittle could fall. You want to take that opportunity to take him if he's there. But as we may see, as we saw here, Aaron Jones fell. And that was something that I pulled the trigger on, even though I'm not the biggest Aaron Jones fan. We know A.J. Dillon is now part of the team. We expect his numbers to regress after having 19 total touchdowns last year, over 1,500 total yards. But I still think he is a second-round pick based on how we're going to see running backs come off the board. So this is how my team unfolded. You see, I waited on a quarterback with Josh Allen in round nine. I took my tight end in round six. Uh, and what we're going to show you here as part of this is what we do on the site. We give you a favorite pick, pick we might regret, and a player who can make or break our team. So for me, those three categories, Daryl Henderson is my favorite pick in round eight. The pick that I regret or might regret is Aaron Jones because of the wide receiver talent that I could have passed on by taking Jones if, in fact, he does regress to a very, very bad place. And the player who can make or break my team is Juju Smith-Schuster. The reason I say that is because if he's not the number one receiver that I expect him to be and more probably in line with how Dave expects him to be, then Juju is not a great pick in round three. So, Ben, since you're joining us now, I'm going to give you the chance. What do you think of how I built this team at number one overall? Yeah, I like it. I, th I think you noted, you know, the potential for Jones to be something you regret. I'm not real high on Marvin Jones as a wide receiver three, and then I, I typically like to have a little bit more wide receiver depth overall, so you're getting into some later round guys after that point, but Deshaun Jackson could certainly be a, a startable player as a round 10 pick, but yeah, in a league where you start three receivers and have a flex, I'd probably like to have more receivers before round 10, but otherwise I think pretty pretty strong team overall. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll be the one that reviews your team when we get to that in a second. Let's go now to Heath's squad at number two. I'll show you the roster first as we take a look at what he did. No surprise, taking Saquon Barkley at the top selection. Three running backs in a row, Heath. So take us through that process. Uh, was that something that you planned or just happened to uh, unfold that way? This might be the first time all off season that I have taken this approach, but I, that you get to a really weird spot at the end of round two, and I think it was true when you picked there with Aaron Jones as well. After Chris Godwin, George Kittle, and Nick Chubb were taken, it kind of felt like there weren't any second round picks left. And so I look at James Conner, most of the history recently for the Pittsburgh Steelers tells us if he can hold up to the workload, he's going to be a feature back. That's generally what they've done. And we've seen when he was a feature back, he was a top five running back. So I took him there and then I took Chris Carson, really for me, the last running back at the end of a tier. I don't generally start with three running backs, but the nice thing about that approach, it is a very, very high reward approach. If those three running backs play even 14 games, this will be a very good team. So then your receiving core is led by by T.Y. Hilton, Keenan Allen, and Julian Edelman. Dave, when you look at that, you see those three wide receivers as his top three guys. As Ben noted, we're starting three wide receivers in this PPR league. What do you think about that? I don't love those guys, but it's PPR, and we know the track record, at least in the case of Allen and Edelman, lots of catches. That's good news. And there's plenty of upside with T.Y. Hilton, but I, they're, they're not guys that I see high upside with. I don't think he's got a wide receiver that's going to finish top 12. I think he's got three that'll certainly be top 25-ish in PPR, provided that they all stay healthy. But that's the price you pay when you take running backs early in draft, and I love it. I was hoping for Connor or Carson to make it back to me in round three in this draft. I was stunned when he took both of them in rounds two and round three. And if you don't like the running backs that are left by the time you get to round five or six, or really when you're looking at our rankings and you see the running backs that are ranked right around like 15th and on, that's the move to make. He's got three stud running backs. Love it for Heath. Yeah, I mean, the trade-off is obviously the wide receivers. And as we look at your categories here, or your superlatives, or maybe the opposite of that, when you're talking about the player who can make or break your team, you have T.Y. Hilton. So start there and then follow up with Carson Wentz and Chris Carson. Wentz being your favorite pick and Carson the pick you might regret. Yeah, I think the interesting thing with those three wide receivers, we say they don't have much upside, but two of those three wide receivers finished in the top seven last year in this format. So that's pretty decent upside. Yes, they've all got new quarterbacks, but I do think Hilton is the one with Phillip Rivers. If he can get back to being T.Y. Hilton again, every time we've seen him with a good quarterback, he...
is a very good wide receiver. He is my best case scenario to have a number one wide receiver this year. If that happens, this team could be awesome with those running backs. But it's not hard to see Hilton and that entire wide receiver core kind of falling apart. My favorite pick, I mean, this is why you wait on quarterback. Carson Wentz has shown us top three upside in the past. He got back to running the ball last year with 240 plus rushing yards. And now he's added speed on the outside. The fact that he was a top eight quarterback with basically no healthy wide receivers, and now he's got some speed on the outside, very encouraging for Wentz. And then we'll just see what happens to those round two and round three running backs. I do I do want to bring up, though, uh, Carson Wentz is not going to make it to round 11 in most leagues. Uh, he's probably going to be round seven or round eight at worst, you know, when we talk about waiting on quarterbacks. So our drafts are going to reflect a little bit different than what your drafts are probably going to look like. But still, the thought being behind you can wait on a quarterback and still get somebody like Carson Wentz. That is the right way to draft. Makes me regret on two of my teams where I took Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. We'll talk about that later in the week. Let's move now to pick number three, which is Dave Richard's squad. And he took Ezekiel Elliott at the third spot. Dave likes DeAndre Hopkins, so he's going to take him at the back end of round two, as he'll explain. And as you see here, a very balanced roster, mixing in running backs and wide receivers all throughout. They've also waited on his quarterback, Russell Wilson, at round seven, and his tight end with Hunter Henry in round nine. So, Dave, what was your thought process at number three overall? I knew with my first three picks I had to have at least two running backs. And when I was up in round two, I couldn't pass on DeAndre Hopkins in a full PPR league. That was just too good of a value, in my opinion. Didn't want to get James Conner or Chris Carson then. I thought... Well, one of those guys will make it back, and neither one of them did. Melvin Gordon did. I think Melvin Gordon is the last really good number two fantasy running back. After him, well, there's, there's want, a lot want, of questions. I want to stop there for a second, and I think that's a, a very fair point because I think Ben would probably take a different approach when you say you wanted to get two running backs with your first three picks. Ben, you do not subscribe to that theory at all, correct? Correct. Explain why. Yeah, I, I, I think running back is a pretty fragile position. It's the most opportunity-based position. Um, I guess the best example would be David Johnson, who you took uh, in the fifth round. That was another guy that stuck out uh, on your team for me. Because last year, he was a first-round pick. And yes, he had some injuries, uh, but most of his value was based on the opportunity that he had. And as soon as he got hurt and Chase Edmonds was really good in that role, and even when Edmonds got hurt, it kind of gave the Cardinals this idea, hey, we could trade for Kenyon Drake. We don't need to keep going forward with David Johnson. And immediately, his value went to almost zero. And that can happen at running back. And then on top of that, there's a higher injury rate. It's a really fragile position. I think when you load up on early running backs, you're kind of locking in a higher bust rate. It's an exponential bust rate when you get more than one in the early rounds. So I like to just do one and then and then go do a little bit safer position at wide receiver. But I look at running backs as the, the cornerstones of fantasy lineups. They score more points than wide receivers, at least the elite running backs do. And I'm not saying that Melvin Gordon's going to be an elite wide receiver or running back, rather. But I think he's going to be really good in Denver. Catch a lot of passes there. That's half the reason why they brought him in. And he scores touchdowns in bunches. He did that in L.A. He'll do that again in Denver. So when I see a running back like that, available in round three, and I know there's going to be nothing like him the rest of the draft, I have to jump on that. I can find wide receivers later in the draft. This is a deep wide receiver class, and I want to be able to catch running backs while I can, and that's why I took Melvin Gordon. It, it, and this is why we're having these conversations. It's different draft, draft strategies for different people and how different fantasy managers approach building your teams. And so, Dave, let's look at your categories here, your favorite pick of this roster, and as you can see here, uh, another, you know, uh, before you get there, I want to ask you one yeah. question. Why three quarterbacks? Value. I was taking them late. Tom Brady fell to round 13. I mean, this is just, it, this. what we did in this draft is egregious. We disrespected quarterbacks completely. Russell Wilson in round 7, are you kidding me? That's amazing. Tom Brady and Daniel Jones after round 12, after round 12. Never going to happen in any other league. I don't care in round 13 if I have four quarterbacks already. Well, that would be weird. But I'm just going to go for value with those late three picks anytime. You guys left Tom Brady there for me. I took him. That's okay. value. So Russell Wilson, you mentioned, is your favorite pick. The pick you might regret is Raheem Mostert. And then we talked about Melvin Gordon. If he doesn't hit, obviously he's going to be a player that you uh, is going to make or break your team. But uh, talk about Wilson and Mostert. Well, Wilson just getting him in round seven, especially knowing that when I was up in late round six, Wilson was still on the board. Kyler Murray was still on the board. Deshaun Watson was still on the board, and I knew that one of those three quarterbacks had to make it to me because he and you, Jamie, were not going to take back-to-back -back quarterbacks in round six and round seven, so I could afford to wait. That's why you pay attention when you're near the end of a round, but not at the end of the round. You pay attention to those teams that are after you in the even rounds and before you in the odd rounds. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and non-stop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.